Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. I want to remind you that Wednesday night right here at 6.30, we begin our five church Lenten series. Uh, Pastor Charlie Watts from Mims will be bringing the message Wednesday night. We will be focusing, all of us, on different parts of the Sermon on the Mount, brain dead there for a moment, which we're calling the Portrait of Jesus. So I encourage you to come and be a part of that. Uh, next week, remember to set your clock forward one hour before you go to bed, unless, like me, you have a clock that sets itself forward one hour, which case you don't want to do that because then you're going to be way early. If you don't set your clock forward, we will smile at you as we are leaving and you are coming. Uh, Spring Festival is scheduled for Saturday, April 4th. We'll be like 10 to 2 across the street. Now, we need people. We need people to come and do games and do help with hot dogs and regulate the bounce house and all of this stuff, okay? We can't do it, two or three of us. So next week we'll have a sign-up sheet, and I'm asking you all to sign up. I, I know some of you are going to say, I'm older, I'm too old. We will give you a chair to sit in if you can't stand up because we really need you to be here to interact with their children, and guess what children bring with them most of the time? Parents. And we need you to be here to interact with their parents because we, we really want to invite them. We want to create relationship as much as we can with them and be in conversation with them because that's how people get started coming to church. All right. This morning we're going to do the service just a little bit differently. Our first hymn is number 558 and it's on the screens above and it's called We Are the Church. So as you stand and greet each other, I'm going to ask the kids to come up here and they're going to kind of lead us with the hand motions to We Are the Church. So would you greet each other warmly in the name of Christ our Lord?
Good morning. Good morning. How many of you know how to play Simon Says? Mr. Kim knows how to play Simon Says too. And everybody who plays, we're going to see that Simon Says, so you can do everything we're going to do right from where you're sitting. So you ready? Okay. Simon Says, raise a hand in the air. Simon says, raise another hand in the air. You guys are doing good. Okay, put it down. I got some of you already. <laughs> okay. Simon says, put your hands down. Simon says, wiggle your head. Oh, that hurts. Stop. Oh, I got a couple. Not very many. Okay, Simon says, stop. You guys are good. You're really good. Now, there's something about Simon Says that I want to point out to you. There are times in life when God says, I want you to do this. God says, I want you to love other people. God says, I want you to share. Now, there's other times, let's say you go to the store, and the person hands you back your money, your change for whatever you bought, but they give you way too much. Now we're playing a game of devil says. Devil says, you got money and go, but what does God say? Give the money back. That's right. And if the devil says something, are we supposed to do it? If I said, devil says, put your arm up, you're like, no way, I'm not putting my arm up. But if I say, God says, give somebody a hug, we give each other hugs. That's very good. Do so you guys know the difference between God says and the devil says? It's a lot like Simon says, but we just have to remember to do it. Sometimes God's voice is very, very quiet. Sometimes it's just a whisper in your ear. But listen, when God says, that's what we do. Let's have prayer together. And I'm going to say, God says, let's have prayer together. Dear God, we love you so much. We know you love us. Help us to hear when you tell us what you want us to do. And help us not do what the devil says. And now we will pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, you are in heaven. As we prepare our hearts to come to the table this morning, we're asked to remember the following people in prayer as you come up. Jerry Copeland. Jerry is in parish with pneumonia and has had the flu. He believes he is over the flu. He is doing well. Patsy Clark, who continues at um, Royal Oak. Also, Jerry's sister-in-law, Janet, is at Royal Oak. Barbara Rao. Jan Gilrith, who will be having surgery on her foot on Wednesday. Morgan Johnson, who is a five-year-old, who will be having a cochlear implant this week. The Fowler and Lindsay family, especially Frank. The family of Jack Road, who passed away on Saturday. Uh, Jeff Davis and his family, Cara, Maddie, and Eleanor. And Natalie Walls. Natalie fell this morning on the steps in the back, and uh, Bill has taken her home. The EMT said that she was okay to go home. So 
be in prayer for those people as you come up to receive communion this morning. Uh, our communion liturgy is a little bit different in the part that I will be reading, but it will all be on the screen today, so I encourage you to follow along there. We will begin, as usual, on page 12 in the hymnal. If you want to follow along in the hymnal, just be aware it'll be a little different. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters. Noah and his family made covenant with every living creature on the earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and on your holy mountain heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on the cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now when your people prepare for your yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night when he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in, your rem in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ to offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Thanks be to God. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As the ushers are coming forward, I want to share with you that in the United Methodist Church, we celebrate an open table. You do not need to be a member of this church or even United Methodist to join with us in communion this morning. We ask that you seek within your heart to live a new life within Christ and to be changed by the Holy Spirit. We take an offering for local need up here. If you would like to leave something on the rail, please feel free to do so. There is no compulsion for that. But we invite you in a moment as the ushers lead you to come forward and to receive from our Lord and to receive his grace. Take, eat, and be thankful unto him.
baptized and offering to your altar, understanding that we've already received the greatest gift of all, the forgiveness of our sins and transgressions through the sacrifice of your Son. Bless our gifts for your unfinished kingdom work. Remind us as we worship here that this redemption of our lives did not come without price. Help us so that we might live always as agents of that boundless love and mercy, making it real to others. Knowing we cannot earn this forgiveness, this wiping clean of our leisure, we can only hope to reflect such grace and compassion in our encounters with others. In his name we pray. Amen. For the ushers, please come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. We used this song last week, and um, I hope you like it because we're going to be using it for the next few weeks. This is our theme song for this year, for Lent, in Christ alone. So I invite you to stand, and the words hopefully will be right this week, and uh, we will sing this together. And I want you to listen to the words as we sing them about their message about Christ for us. Would you join together in singing? This corner. 
Before I start the sermon this morning, I want to tell you that uh, Wednesday night we had our Ash Wednesday service and we had seven prayer stations. And on the back table right back there is the first prayer station set up. And I encourage you, if you didn't come and you would like to, stop at that prayer station. And there's some dirt there and that's all I'm going to tell you about the dirt. And there's some stuff to read that explains it. And when you leave this morning, uh, we have some little postcards to give you that talk more about that for you to use this week in your prayer time. So I encourage you to take those as we go through Lent and as we draw closer to God. So you've been fooled a little bit. Uh, The title of the sermon is not that old time religion. The title of the sermon is actually don't give me that old time religion because I know people get offended before they know what's going on. You see, we talk about old-time religion, but we really don't always know what we're talking about. We talk about the things we learned, good, bad, or indifferent, about God and about church and about everything else. But see, there's some things in the past that the church did and that was part of the church that needs to be left in the past because it was not positive. It was hurtful, and it hurt people severely. This morning, Diana read to you something that was from that old-time religion. The Pharisees, through Moses, the the Pharisees that resulted, allowed a man to divorce his wife with no reason at all. If she burned his dinner one time, all he had to do was walk her out to the city gate and say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and they were done. And she left with nothing. She left with nothing but the clothes on her back. Why 
then do we now accept divorce? Well, there's a difference in our world today. The purpose of not accepting divorces in biblical times is the woman was put out on the street with nothing, and she was a woman. Her family is likely not going to take her back because she's used tainted goods. They don't want her back because they can't, forgive me, gentlemen, they can't sell her again because that was what a marriage was, was an exchange of property for a woman. And if she was pretty, you got more camels and goats than if she was ugly. And if she looked like she could bear children, you got more camels and goats than if she looked like she couldn't. It was a financial transaction. It was arranged. There was no, no love, no, uh, you know, oh, I love her. It's just like, mm, that's who you're getting. But see, when a man divorced a woman and let her go, she had two choices in life, typically. She could beg or she could become a prostitute. So to divorce your wife literally meant to throw her away, that, that she didn't please you anymore and she was not any good and she's gone and she's out and she's worthless. And it threw a woman on the doorstep of society for pity. She had no way to support herself. She was broken. And Jesus says right here, well, that was wrong. It was wrong of Moses to allow you to divorce. Now, I don't want you to think I'm one of these divorce freaks that says you can never get a divorce. Divorces happen. Divorces don't break the vow. The vow's already broken. There are many reasons beyond infidelity. If my daughter's husband hit her, she wouldn't have to divorce him because I'd probably kill him. And I'm not joking. I, I would not put up with my child or any other woman being abused verbally or physically but we've had both ways where you could divorce her for nothing and then where the wife had to stay regardless of what was going on if she was a member of the church in most denominations if she left her husband no matter what was going on she was out she was looked down on and it's not just women. If we go back to this same era, Paul who wrote that let women be subject to their husbands also said let slaves be subject to their masters. We don't believe in slavery anymore either. You see, there's things in the past of Christianity that just need to stay where they are. Here's the point. Before I go to the next thing to talk about it. God does not change. Hopefully, our understanding of God changes every day. Because Christianity is a revealed religion which is revealed through the power of the Holy Spirit to us and within us. And as we discover more and more of history, we discover more and more things we didn't know to begin with. When we look at the Gospels, the oldest piece of a gospel we have is about this big and it has like 30 words on it and it's written like 150 years after Jesus. So we're still learning as we look at all these different edits, if you would. I don't think God intended for women to be thrown in the streets to live however they could. But I don't think God intended for us to be sick either. You see, that's the other thing the church has often thought. Uh, Lauren and I are doing a class on um, disabilities. Did you finish your paper, Lauren? Yeah. Me too. We're finished till the next one. What they pointed out to us and what they had us reading is about David and the son of Jonathan, Mephizabeth. And how the people looked at Mephizabeth because he was impaired. And it was assumed that because he was impaired, it was due to sin. So that if anybody in the Old Testament was sick or lost their fortune or had an accident, it was because they'd sinned. It was their fault and God was punishing them. Wow. It comes into the New Testament and we find the Pharisees asking Jesus when he meets the man that was born blind, the Pharisees say to Jesus, well, who sinned? Did he sin before he was born or is this a result of his parents' sin? And Jesus said, neither one. This was to prove the power of God within me. You see, we need to leave all this stuff about, oh, God's punishing you. I grew up with that, folks. 
That is why I'm no longer primitive Baptist. Because I heard my dear friends talk about a woman that I knew. It was her second marriage. Her husband had died. She and her, father, her new father-in-law had had problems. She had a child born with a hole in her heart. Now, in case you don't know, when you have children born with a hole in heart, they can live, but they go through many surgeries. They can't get upset. They can't do this. They can't do that. And, and it's, they have times where it's very touch and go. Just so happened her little girl, after this big blow up in the family, had an episode and had to go to the hospital, and they weren't sure she was going to live. And I heard someone say this. God is getting her for how she acted through that child. If you believe that, come see me tomorrow. We need to chat. That stuff needs to be left behind. That child was born with a hole in her heart because we live in a fallen and broken world. And as a result of that fallen and broken world, sickness, impairment, disease, accidents, brokenness, all that stuff happens. And it breaks the heart of God. God created us in his image, not, not to be broken, but we are broken. And we live in a broken world. And I hear people say, oh, well, she never smoked, but she got cancer. How's that broken world? Do any of you breathe when you go outside? Okay. Do you think God is punishing the world with the coronavirus? Or that my uncle, who was 10 years old in 1918 and almost died of, of the Spanish flu, was any more sinful than the rest of his brothers and sisters. Or as Jesus said, you know those people that that tower fell on in Jerusalem? You think they were worse than anybody else? You see, church has held that sin brings sickness, and sometimes it does. But it's something that we have done, not something God's done to us. If you get in your car and you drive 100 miles an hour down Highway 1, you're going to hit something sooner or later. If you go to a bar and you drink in excess till you have alcohol poisoning, you're likely going to die. If you smoke for 50 years and develop lung cancer, well, guess what? But God didn't do that to you. God allowed you to have a life and have free will. And sometimes these questions, when we say things like a child dies and we say, God needed another angel causes people to doubt God and question God and ask hard questions of God and then people say, oh, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't doubt. Well, this attitude about women and this attitude about sickness and this attitude about doubt need to go bye-bye. What does doubt make you do? If you doubt something, what do you do? You research it, you study, you learn, you grow, you, you continue to try to find out more. Doubt in your faith, if your faith can't stand up to doubt, you don't have much. I doubt a lot of things, and I research a lot of things. And sometimes you may say something to me, and I'm going to say, got to look that up and find out more. I don't know everything. I'm still growing in my faith. I'm still growing in my understanding of Scripture, and hopefully I'm still growing in my understanding of who God is. You see, there are things we need to leave behind because we don't know it all yet. And when we say, oh, I don't need to study the Bible or, oh, I don't need to learn this, or we're saying something we don't want to say. And unfortunately, I have a friend that said it. In our current brokenness in the United Methodist Church, I have a friend who said to me, I am absolutely positively sure I am right. I said, oh, you are. I am positive I am right. I said, so you're telling me you fully understand the heart and the mind of God. He said, yep. I said, brother, you better be careful because hellfire is burning all around your feet because you've just committed blasphemy because no one fully understands the heart and the mind of God. We need to continue to grow in our faith. Our series is based on a book, What's the Least I Can Believe and Still Be a Christian. Well, I could tell you some people that would give you a list a mile long that includes 
You have to be baptized. You have to take communion. Weekly, monthly, quarterly, daily, you choose. You have to believe this set of rules. And you have to do this and you have to do this. It's kind of like being ordained in ministry. When you go in, you're dealing with people who have been through the process. Kind of like anything you do to get a license. And the people who are sitting there say, well, they made me do this. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So, let's add H, I, J, K to it. You see, the reveal, revealed religion in the Bible is about one thing. Accepting, accepting the love of Christ and being changed by the love of Christ. Accepting the love of Christ and being changed by the love of Christ. It's not about knowing the Bible backwards and forwards. It's not about being able to recite the creeds. It's not about all the rules churches make. It's about Jesus in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at different attributes of Jesus. We're going to be asking questions. So I want you to learn the first lesson I learned in seminary. Very first lesson. Well, let me, should I tell them my story, Ed, from this morning? I want to share this story with you. It has nothing to do with, but it has everything to do with it. I believe it was my high school graduation. A PhD professor from FSU came and spoke at our baccalaureate. And she said, I welcome you to the world of ignorance. She said, when you're born, you're really smart because you don't know nothing, so you can't be ignorant. Well, now, ignorant is what you don't know or thinking you know what you don't know. So she said, you go to school, and we send you to school for 12, I guess 13 years now, and you graduate from high school, and you're ignorant in a broad field, everything. Then we send you off to college, and you get a bachelor's degree, and you narrow your field down. So you're only ignorant in one area. And then if you keep going, we send you to graduate school, and you narrow your field of ignorance even more. You become ignorant in a pretty defined area. And then, if you go on and do a PhD, you become very ignorant in a very thin slice of life. Because no matter how much we know, there will always be a hundred times more about any subject that we don't know. And she finished her statement like this. Go thou and be like me. Go thou and be ignorant. You know, it takes a lot for Christians to admit they don't know everything. I grew up with people who, if they didn't know, they'd make up an answer. Often it was wrong. And when I started seminary, they said, this is the first and most important lesson we want you to learn. Stay teachable. Stay teachable. We can never know everything about Christ, and we can certainly never know most of the things about God. But as the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us every day in our walk, through the scripture, through our friends, we come into closer relationship. We can let that stuff that we try to hold over everybody else's heads go because we're comfortable in our relationship with Christ. So we don't need to appear more intelligent than we are. We don't need to feel like we've arrived because we haven't. It's a journey. And the joy is in that journey. If you've ever taken a class with me, you know I get excited and dance around. And, oh, this is cool stuff because we're learning something new. Or maybe we're learning something old again. So be teachable. Be open 
to the Spirit's work within you and the Spirit's guiding you. Because see, Christ didn't come to put us in this building to hear a message. Christ came to change our lives and the way we live and the way we relate. And if we start living more like Christ, we're going to have to have 14 services in this building because we're not going to have enough room. Because that's what attracts people. When you love others as Christ has loved you, no one cares what you know until they know that you care. So let's start to look at what we believe. I, I encourage you to ask these questions. Who, what, when, where, and why? It's not doubting God. It's asking God to help you grow and to become who you are in him. So where is it you need to ask some questions? Where is it you need to learn more? Where is it you need to ask deep, hard questions of yourself and of the Spirit? Where is it you need to ask for guidance? Only you know that. I pray for us all to be listening, to be hearing, to be studying, to be researching, to be reading, and to be growing in our grace. Let's pray. Father, we are forgiven by your grace, yet we are a people always in need of more grace. Use us, change us, help us to grow. Clarify for us the things that we struggle with and lead us out of this place to be in relationship with those around us so that they may truly see the love of Christ within us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And now would you stand and join me as we sing, Let's be the time. Terrible. morning I'm going to ask you to turn towards the exit doors but I'm not going to ask you to join hands because they are one of the things we're being told is don't ask people to join hands um, some of you may have questions about what we're going to do about the coronavirus right now we're going to pray we're going to wash our hands and we're going to be careful but we're not going to freak out as I hear more from above me and from others who are way more than intelligent with me, I will share that with you. But at this time, just be careful and be wise. Don't put yourself in a bad place. And now go forth in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, sharing his love and his grace, opening your heart to hear in prayer and being teachable in him. Amen. Amen. You got that. Amen.